Okay. So we just started recording. All right. Okay. I think we can get started. So thank you everyone for joining us. So welcome to our fourth VT Reach session. We're so excited to have everyone here. These are our virtual teleconferences. Reach stands for Reach, Explore, and Aspire to Careers in Healthcare, where we get to showcase all different avenues of healthcare careers. And tonight we have a really exciting session on psychiatry and speech language pathology. And so we have two incredible speakers here. So we're joined by Dr. Jeremiah Dickerson, who is a psychiatrist, and Molly Bumpus, who is a speech language pathologist. So they'll be the two who we will be highlighting in this session, and we're really excited to hear from them. And they'll be talking about their journeys to their careers, as well as how they work together, which is a really interesting part of their jobs. And so we will begin, let me just bring Dr. Dickerson up. And then you can, make, you can take it away when you're ready. Excellent. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Jillian and Lillian, for the invitation to come talk to this group. I think um, it's really exciting for Molly and I to share sort of our journeys and to share what we do together. Um, it's super exciting. We have a lot of fun um, <laughs> doing what we do, but it's also um, a, a somewhat challenging job at the same time, which I think we'll have some time to talk about as well. So my name is Jeremiah, and I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist, um, which means I have expertise in um, talking to kids about their feelings and emotions. And um, what's nice is I'm also adult psychiatry trained as well. And so I can potentially treat the entire family in terms of thinking about mental health issues and um, prevention and fostering uh, mental wellness uh, at the same time. So my inspiration into healthcare, so I guess this is sort of talking about my journey. Um, so I grew up in upstate New York in a small village called Watkins Glen, which um, frankly is known for its NASCAR races every summer. Um, I'm not a NASCAR fan, so I didn't really grow up going to races, um, but I was kind of a nerd in school. So I really found myself kind of gravitating towards um, sort of math and science, um, but I also really enjoyed the humanities. I love to read. Um, I really engaged in reading from an early age. And one of the kind of, kind of book series that I gravitated towards was the Hardy Boys, um, which is kind of like an old school sort of mystery series. There was a sort of Nancy Drew version as well. Um, things were very gendered back in the 1980s, um, much more than they are now. But I loved reading the Hardy Boys and I loved thinking about mysteries and um, solving mysteries. And over the course of my studies, particularly in high school and then in college, I really found that that helped to sort of connect my interest and medicine and talking to people and really trying to figure out what's wrong and sort of solving medical mysteries. And one of the other kind of aspects of my adolescence that I think really kind of fostered that too was this television show ER, um, which was pretty popular uh, back in, in the 90s. And it was also very dramatic as well. And it was one of the first, I, I don't come from a family of doctors. I'm the first doctor in my family. And so this was sort of an introduction for me into the world of medicine, albeit, you know, very dramatized, very sensationalized, um, but super exciting, like hearing all sort of the medical language, um, all the blood, kind of learning about anatomy. Um, it was a lot of fun. So I, I sort of fell in love with the drama of it all. Um, and like I said earlier, this, you know, I'm the first doctor in my family. So um, early on, it, the process of becoming a doctor was quite unfamiliar to me. And so there was a lot of sort of self-directed learning um, throughout high school and college to, to sort of get me um, towards the path of medical school. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I, um, after high school, I went to RPI, which is sort of a science and engineering school um, outside of Albany in Troy, New York. And um, I eventually majored in biology, which was a pretty classic route um, to go into medical school, but I was also a, a studio art minor. So it sort of captured um, 
both sides of my brain in terms of, again, really falling in love with the science um, and also like loving to draw and to paint and to do sculpture and to talk about art and continue to read books at the same time. And I started off as an engineering major, um, but quickly found that it was not for me. It was too heavy science. And so I switched to bio um, and then became sort of more interested in sort of the interface between science and society, thinking about how medicine um, impacts people's lives and about marginalized communities, particularly um, the world of HIV AIDS. Um, and this was back in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And I sort of became interested in more sort of sociology um, at the same time. Um, and then during undergrad, um, you know, over the summers, I found myself doing some research, kind of um, plant research at Cornell, um, which is close to where I lived. And so that was pretty fascinating um, and kind of reinvigorated my interest in science at the same time. Um, and then I worked with kids. I was a summer camp counselor um, for a couple of years um, and sort of found that niche as well. And that sort of started to get me thinking about the possibility of, of going into pediatrics. Um, I also volunteered at Albany Med, which was close to where I went to undergrad. Um, worked there for a year and a half as well to build my experience working with patients. Took the MCAT a couple times um, and applied to medical school. And I applied all over um, and was accepted at a handful of places for medical school. Ended up going to SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. Um, it was close by, it was close to my home. Um, but what really um, intrigued me about it was frankly the in-state tuition offered by um, a SUNY school for a New York State resident. And I, I stand by that choice, even though, you know, we don't need to talk about my student loan debt, but um, it is something um, that a lot of us in the world of medicine deal with and manage um, and is in sort of the background. Um, for a long time for us because we pay a lot of money to go to school, but um, being able to go to a SUNY um, medical school really saved me a lot of money. Initially, like I said, I um, was considering um, sort of a path in pediatrics. I joined a lot of like pediatric interest groups, did a lot of volunteering on the peds wards um, and really enjoyed it. And then in third year, when we start our clerkships, um, I did psychiatry early on. And like most medical students, I didn't have really any exposure to the world of psychiatry. It was a very, very foreign world to me, um, especially dealing with and seeing people who struggled with severe mental illness. Thinking about folks who have bipolar disorder, um, folks who have experienced a significant amount of trauma, um, people presenting with psychoses, um, schizophrenia. It was super overwhelming but also at the same time, very, very interesting to me, thinking about what is going on in these people's brains. Um, and so I thought, hmm, psychiatry might be um, something that I'm interested in. I never considered it before, but was still interested in pediatrics at the same time. I did a couple of electives, um, one of which was in adolescent medicine, so working closely with teenagers. Um, I worked at a juvenile detention facility during medical school, um, did a rotation there. Um, and sort of over time, I was able to combine my interests and learned about the world of child psychiatry, thinking about pediatrics, adolescent medicine, um, and working with folks who um, are struggling with mental health issues. So I ended up graduating medical school and um, matched here at UVM for my adult psychiatry residency. It's a four year residency training program um, pretty intensive. Um, I was chief resident my last year. And um, after that, I did a two year fellowship um, where I specifically focused on learning more about child psychiatry. So a total of six years of training after four years of medical school, after four years of undergrad. And um, when I finished residency and fellowship, I stayed here, joined the faculty in 2011, um, and I still am here today. And over the past 10 years or so, I've um, been able to really kind of figure out my niche and which Molly and I will talk about. I mean, I, I think that's one of the, the real joys of working here in Vermont, um, as it's relatively easy that if you really love something and are passionate about it and are able to kind of communicate that passion and share that passion and just sort of be kind of a nice, kind human being at the same time, um, 
you know, you could really excel um, at your job and really make really wonderful professional relationships with a, with a wide range of people who also share a similar passion. Um, and I find psychiatry is just sort of my, the perfect blend for me of thinking about science and the humanities and sort of the power of connection and the importance of relationships. Um, and also thinking about sort of the world of social determinants of mental health and health equity and the role that plays um, in the patients that we see. So it's a really exciting time to be in psychiatry. I think we deal with the brain, right? Which is one of the most, or the most, arguably the most complicated organ in the human body. Um, and there's so much more we need to, we, we don't know. Um, and so it really is an exciting time to kind of be interested in neuroscience and psychiatry and um, sort of the humanistic side of, of mental health at the same time. So this is sort of what I do. Um, this is how I spend my time. So 50% of my time, I get to work with Molly. Um, we actually, I feel like we work more than 50% of our time together um, just because we love to hang out and have fun. Um, but we do autism diagnostic evaluation. So my clinical work is focused on autism. Um, and I also see a fair number of outpatients of all ages, ranging from the age of two or three up into the age of like 65 or 70, um, seeing folks who are um, presenting with mental health issues. Um, I previously spent some time at Woodside as their consulting psychiatrist. Um, and one of the things I love about psychiatry is just the range of patients that I get to see and the range of people that I get to work with. We're often consulting with schools, which is really great to build those relationships. Um, and some of my outpatient work has been highly focused on engaging with families who um, have children who are um, transgender or gender nonconforming and being a part of that world and a part of those um, kids and teenagers journeys um, and exploring their, their gender identity has been really, really um, an incredible privilege to be a part of, frankly. So that's 50% of my time, which is mainly focused on clinical work. The other 50% of my time is I get to teach. So I direct the medical student education in psychiatry. I oversee the psychiatry clerkship, which is a required rotation that all students have to take as they get exposure to psychiatry. I do a lot of mentoring and advising of both medical students, undergrads, residents, and fellows. Um, and then I, I teach specifically in, in certain courses in the medical school as well, the medical neuroscience course, um, the human development course. Um, I teach an elective in graphic medicine where we read graphic novels and talk about how those graphic novels depict psychiatry. Um, and that led to an interest in developing a new undergraduate course here at UVM, which I'm teaching for the first time next fall about psychiatry and the portrayal of mental health issues in the media. So watching movies, television shows, reading books, and thinking about how mental health and mental health issues are portrayed um, on television and books and media. So that's, that's gonna be super exciting. And again, one of my passions that I feel really um, eager to sort of share with, with learners. Work-life balance, oh man. Um, I think we have a pretty decent work-life balance in the world of psychiatry. Uh, I am also married to a psychiatrist, so we are a two-physician family, which um, can sort of make work-life balance a little complicated. We have um, two relatively young children who are finishing the third grade, going to be entering fourth grade. And so it is kind of tricky to um, balance work-life, home life. Um, but I feel like my job here at UVM and my wife's job um, allow us to do that. Um, we have help though. <laughs> my wife's family lives close by. And so there's no way that we could raise two children and be two um, academic uh, medical professionals at the same time. Um, but we do, um, we make it work. We have a lot of fun. Um, and again, I think we, we do have a fairly um, decent work-life balance. One of the hard aspects of our job, and Miley and I can speak to this later, is our hours may not be hard or long, um, but one of the difficulties of our job is leaving work at work. Um, we hear a lot of hard stories. We see a lot of families who are struggling mightily, um, especially thinking about the, the past year, the pandemic and the, the sort of mental health um, uh, kind of outcomes of the pandemic, people are really struggling. And so sometimes it can be hard to hear stories um, 
over and over again, repeatedly day after day and, and try to help these folks um, and do the best you can within a system that um, is really, um, really needs a lot more resources, frankly. And so you're often stuck sort of holding a lot of affect um, and holding a lot of hard stories, but um, I'm thankful to have a team in which to kind of um, share these stories with and kind of help decompress uh, at the end of the day. So that's sort of the work-life balance um, in a nutshell. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Dickinson. And just a reminder, we'll have time to put any questions into the chat. Um, and so now we will introduce Molly Bumpus, who is a speech language pathologist, and she can take it away. Thank you, Jillian. Um, hi, my name is Molly, and uh, I am a speech language pathologist. Um, I have a lot of strange looking letters after my name, so I can kind of explain what those are. Um, so a CCC SLP uh, basically means that um, you have gone through to get your certificate of clinical competency in speech language pathology. And then a BCBA is a board certified behavior analyst, which means you're a practitioner of applied behavior analysis, which is basically a science of increasing socially significant behavior. Um, and since ABA is an evidence-based practice uh, in autism treatment, I decided to become dually certified as an SLP and a BCBA. Okay, and it's so funny to see inspiration into healthcare because if you had told me in high school that I was gonna be working in a medical center, I would have told you there is no way. Um, <laughs> so I grew up outside of Richmond, Virginia um, and to a family full of school teachers, people that worked in the school system. Um, my parents were school teachers. I have two sisters, both of them went into education and teaching. And I always sort of in high school gravitated toward English. Um, I took four years of Latin. I was really into languages. And I always kind of knew I wanted to be in a helping profession, but wasn't really sure what, what that was going to look like. Um, I had never heard of a speech language pathologist when I was in high school. Um, and so I just knew that I wanted to be in a career where I was going to help people's lives be better. And my parents really inspired me to do that just by the way they live their lives, um, always putting others first. So they're sort of my inspiration and um, yeah. Next slide. Okay, so my education, um, I have a BA in religious studies, believe it or not. I went to a small liberal arts college in Fredericksburg, Virginia called Mary Washington College. Um, and I was studying all kinds of religions of the world and fascinated with all of these big philosophical ideas. Um, and I wrote a thesis on Elie Wiesel, who uh, was a survivor of the Holocaust and wrote a seminal work called Night, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. He had a big impact on me and his writings did. And I ended up writing a thesis about the inextricable fates of God and man through the good times and the bad, that there was a link. Um, like Jeremiah, I also was a summer camp counselor and, and really enjoyed being with children. Um, I also, you know, I, I figured after I graduated with my religious studies degree, I was going to get a master's degree and then I was going to get a doctorate. And I was just going to stay in academia forever talking about these theological ideas. Um, but my life didn't quite work out that way. So after school, I ended up doing a few different things, um, starting off with being a barista in a coffee shop for about a year because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I ended up volunteering at a nonprofit law office because I thought I might want to be a lawyer um, that helps people who can't afford lawyers. And then I answered an ad to work at a school in Virginia for kids with autism. And this was back like in the mid nineties before autism was what we know as autism today, where it's, it's more something that everyone is aware of. Um, this was a different time. So I ended up um, answering this ad 
And it was a small school called the Virginia Institute of Autism that was founded by parents because the public schools didn't know what to do with their children. I didn't know how to teach them. They weren't learning and the parents were thinking we've got to do something. So they started this school and they, um, they got training from uh, professionals at Princeton and how to teach their kids. And then they trained all of us. And so this school really changed my career path and it actually kind of changed my life. Um, so I fell in love with these kids and then I ended up learning everything I could about autism. Um, I learned how to do ABA therapy. Um, but what particularly interested me and really challenged me was that these children really were struggling to communicate. And I thought there's gotta be more I can learn to help these kids learn how to communicate. I really feel like communication is a basic human right for all people. Um, and so I started researching and then that led me to the field of speech language pathology. So I decided that I wanted to be an SLP. And I spent, so I applied to the University of Virginia uh, cause I was living in Charlottesville, Virginia at the time. And I got into their three-year program because I had no background in uh, communication sciences. So if you have a communication sciences degree, you can get your graduate degree in two years. If you don't, then I had to make up all of the coursework that I would have done as an undergrad. So I did a three-year, very intense program, including summers, um, and I learned a lot. So I, I had to when you do a graduate degree in speech language pathology, you have to do a wide range of learning. So you can't just go in and say, I want to do autism. So I just want to learn about this part of speech language pathology. You have to do it all. So I learned about language disorders, speech sound disorders, motor speech disorders, voice disorders, swallowing and feeding disorders, stuttering, um, traumatic brain injury, it, the list goes on and on. Um, so it was a bit overwhelming because it was a lot of material to cover, but it was also very interesting. And I learned something, I enjoyed learning about all of it, even if I knew it wasn't what I ultimately wanted to do. Um, and I got to do internships in all kinds of settings. I worked in a school, I worked in an adult inpatient hospital, I worked in a pediatric rehab center with kids that had really severe TBIs. Um, traumatic brain injuries. Um, and it was, it was invaluable experience, but through it all, I always knew that autism was where I wanted to land and that that was my calling. Um, I really do feel like my work has been more of a calling than a job. Um, so post-graduation, you have to pass, so you have your master's degree. So now you still have to pass a national exam and then you still have to do a nine month fellowship post-graduation in order to get your C's or your certificate of clinical competency. So you can have that CCC-SLP behind your name. So I had to do that, um, but I kept my goal of working in autism and I've done that ever since my graduation. So, and it's been a good, oh, 20 years now. So um, I worked in a pediatric clinic. I've worked in schools. Um, early intervention center. And now I'm at the University of Vermont. Um, and along the way, I decided to also become a board certified behavior analyst. Um, because I do feel like, especially for children on the spectrum, the communication is challenging. And then that leads to some behavior challenges. And I feel like communication and behavior are just two sides of the same coin. A child is having a challenging behavior because they can't communicate something that they need to communicate. So I became very interested in having all the pieces of, of in my toolkit to help these kids. So I ended up becoming a BCBA, which involved um, 15 graduate credits, uh, 1,500 mentored hours in working in the field of ABA, and then a national exam. Next slide. Okay, so my job at uh, University of Vermont. Um, so my job is a bit like Jeremiah's, a bit of a combination of a lot of different things. So 75% of the time, I'm working in the autism assessment clinic in child psychiatry. 
with Dr. Dickerson, um, along with our clinical psychologist, and um, working and doing diagnostics. I do three assessments a week um, with Dr. Dickerson and then with another doctor and a different team. Um, and it's, it's kind of my dream job. I always wanted to do diagnostics and it was on my bucket list, but I never imagined that I would get a chance to actually do it. So I feel very fortunate um, to have found this position. And so I get to do autism specific tests. Um, one specifically is the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. And it's sort of the gold standard of tests in autism at this point in time. And then I also get to do general speech language testing, whatever is needed for the team. Uh, and in this process of working in the clinic, you know, as Dr. Dickerson was saying, we get to hear from families. I think that's my favorite part of diagnostics is getting to meet a family for the first time and a child and saying, tell me your story. And it's a privilege to hear these stories. It really is. Um, so we get to have those time with the families. We are very lucky in that we are grant funded clinics. So we have the gift of time. So we get to see kids over a two day time period, um, which is not a typical setup um, in the fee for service model. So we also get to work as a team and really put our heads together and look at all the data we've collected and come up with decisions. Um, and then we also have amazing students that get to work in our clinic. I supervise speech language pathology graduate students. We often have medical students. We sometimes have psychiatry fellows. So we have a lot of learners in our clinic, which I think keeps us inspired and keeps us really um, wanting to be the best that we can be. So it's, it, it's a really, exciting environment. And then 20% of my time, I'm running a parent training program for families with newly diagnosed toddlers with autism, um, which is wonderful because I still get to have my foot in treatment a little bit, um, which, which, is, which is a good thing. And then the other 5% of my time, um, I'm doing general faculty things for the communication sciences and disorders program, um, supervising other students in our on-campus speech language and hearing clinic. Work-life balance. I feel um, this is always such a tricky topic, particularly being a mom of two kids. I work full time. Um, so it's always, I don't think you ever really achieve this work-life balance, um, but I think we're always trying, right? Um, so with a typical work week, you know, with all the evaluations, um, the parent training program, student supervision meetings, there's lots of meetings in general, um, so there's always meetings. Um, it's 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 tough, and like uh, Jeremiah was saying, it, it it can be emotionally emotionally tiring job. Um, so we also have feedback meetings every week where we're talking to families about what we feel their diagnosis is, um, and and you know we we work really hard to be as present and as accessible and empathic as we can, and so that takes a lot of energy. Um, but I try to stay mentally and physically healthy. Um, luckily I have a dog. So that forces me to walk my dog every day. Um, and I have amazing community of friends who keep me grounded. And, um, my favorite form of therapy is karaoke. And so I'm hoping it will be back soon post COVID because I need some karaoke therapy, frankly. And that's my story. Thank you so much, both of you. And so now if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we have a question for Dr. Dickerson. How far into your career did you begin teaching alongside your clinical work and did it require any additional training? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when we finish medical school and become residents and whatever field we're, we're training in, um, you become faculty members as part of the institution then that you're in. So um, as residents, you're teaching clinically all the time. Um, you're having medical students with you. Um, there are undergraduates who shadow us as well. Um, but throughout residency and fellowship, I learned that this is something that I really love doing. And I tried really hard to carve out more of my time in order to do that. It's a really tricky thing to do, especially in the world of mental health where um, there's, there are very long wait lists 
to, to see us. And Molly and I can speak to our own wait list and for our autism diagnostic clinic, um, it's, it's several months. And so it's, it's really tricky sometimes to kind of like, you wanna carve out time to teach, but you also wanna be available to all of the people that need help, but you also need to take care of yourself. And frankly, if, if I saw patients five days a week, um, you know, eight hours a day, um, I don't know how healthy I would be, <laughs> frankly, again, hearing those stories all the time. And so it's really, it's really helpful to find out what balances your life. And for me, it's teaching and um, it's being mm -hmm. with students and being with learners and sharing my passion. And so like five years ago, I um, was approached about teaching undergrads and I was like, oh my God, how am I ever gonna do that? Um, I don't have time to do that. But they were like, develop a course in whatever you wanna teach. And so I, I don't know if there's any UVM undergrads on this Zoom call um, who, uh, so I, I developed a course called Sex, Love and the Neuroscience of Relationships. And this was a course where I was able to fuse psychiatry and talking about attachment and autism and trauma and raising children um, and gender issues, like all of my favorite things clinically, I was able to develop a course about. Um, and that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of hard work. Um, the first year I taught it, I had um, over 50 students enroll, which was surprising to me. I guess not surprising given the title, but um, I was not prepared to teach 50 undergrads, but I loved every second of it. Um, and so I taught that course for a handful of years and now I have this new course that I'm interested in developing. And so um, it does take time away from me clinically. Um, we often don't get compensated for our teaching. Um, and so there is, there is a lot of um, sort of self, um, kind of self drive that's attached to teaching that I, I really enjoy, but I do think it brings a, a needed balance to my work week at the same time. So there really, there really is no additional training required outside of residency, but it does helpful to um, engage in some sort of learning about how to teach. Um, because we may all think that we know how to teach, but I have learned more from my undergrads in terms of teaching methods um, and the feedback that I've gotten, because you guys are not shy also about giving feedback, which is wonderful because um, it keeps us humble um, as it should. But I learned so much from the students that I teach and um, it, it just helps also to stay on top of topics that's, you know, I teach about social media, but, you know, as a 41 year old, like, what do I know about TikTok and Twitter? Um, you guys in the, you know, certainly know more than I. So it's, it's a very sort of um, dynamic relationship in terms of teaching that I enjoy. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Um, another question that both of you um, could answer, you both kind of had this unique portion of your undergraduate studies Dr. Dickerson, you saying you had a minor in studio art and Molly, you saying that your major was in religious studies. Have you felt that those two, you know, those studies or that aspect of your education has helped with your now career in healthcare in any way, shape or form? Ooh, good yeah, question. Molly, you can go first. <laughs> um, gosh, I mean, I mean, yes, I mean, getting a religious studies degree is a lot like getting a philosophy degree where you learn to think about ideas um, and how to talk about ideas and compare and contrast perspectives, um, which I feel like we still have to do a lot of times in the work that we do, um, how to hold these two things that are both true at the same time and be able to have the nuance to handle that, right? Um, so I, I do feel as far as that piece, uh, it has stayed with me as well as just learning how to write. Um, I think it's important, you know, we have to churn out these reports uh, that we choose to really put a lot into our reports because we know, we know they're going out there and going with a family and a child and we want we want to give as much information um, to that team that's taking it as possible, but they're very lengthy. And so you have to be able to be able to write 
um, and write down your ideas and impressions and observations and thoughts very clearly in a fast turnaround time. Um, so the skill of writing, I feel like, has stayed with me from that from that degree as well. Yeah, I would I would echo what Molly said. I think a couple things come to mind in terms of thinking about art and the humanities and medicine. And this is, again, this is sort of a, a hot topic for me because I, I do think we need to focus more on bringing the humanities into medical education. Um, and as you guys may know, like a lot of medical schools are looking for students who may not have majored in biology. Certainly you're taking the prereqs, right? In order to kind of meet the requirements to apply to a school of medicine, but um, we're looking for learners who are creative. And for me, um, having a focus in art um, fostered that creativity in me. And I think that helps, especially in psychiatry where there's a lot of gray. Um, you know, our, we don't have, we can't put people yet in a MRI machine and scan in our brain and determine whether or not they're struggling with depression or determine sort of how severe their anxiety is. Where we get our information is by talking to people and actively listening to people. And I think that's a skill. And I think that's a skill that sometimes comes from studying the arts and studying the humanities, because it allows you to appreciate the nuance of something. Um, you're looking at something, you're asked to describe something. Um, and also it allows you to appreciate the ambiguity of, of something that there may not be a right answer, there may not be a wrong answer, but how do you sit with that? And how do you feel comfortable with that? Um, and also in psychiatry, we talk a lot about emotions and um, there's not a lot of talk about emotions outside of psychiatry in the world of medicine. Um, and I could talk for hours about this and how that impacts like student wellness. Like medical students are expected to kind of be at the top of their game during like the, what could be like the four hardest years of their life, right? And that's a tricky balance to strike. And so I think having an interest in arts and the humanities really helps to temper that and kind of build that balance. Um, and there's also evidence that, that studying arts and humanities fosters empathy. It allows you to empathize with other people in a much more natural way. Um, and then there's research to say that when you're in medical school, empathy actually declines the further you get in medical training. And so um, it's just an interesting kind of dynamic to think about what is it about training that for those of us in, who are studying to be doctors, like we get less empathic over time. Um, and so using the humanities to kind of um, limit burnout, I think is really important. And I've started bringing my clerkship students who are rotating in psychiatry we spend a couple hours at the Fleming Museum. So they're taken off their clinical rotations. We go to the Fleming Museum. We spend a couple hours looking at art. Um, and we have this wonderful museum educator who works with us and just allows like some reflection. Um, and what's, what's my favorite part about that is students who have no interest in art um, come to that session and they, they give really tremendous feedback. Like, wow, I, I've never spent more than 10 minutes in an art museum. And here I am spending an hour and a half looking at one single painting. This was really cool. And you get to hear your classmates comment on it and reflect on things. And so I do think there's, there's something to be said about um, sort of unconventional backgrounds um, leading into the world of, of clinical work. Thank you so much for that. That is a really something so interesting to sit with, especially because Lily and I are both finishing our um, degrees or we just graduated and just thinking about how much emphasis we've always put on science and how much of a relief really that side of things is and reading. I took a Harry Potter class this year. And it was one of my favorite college classes with such a science background being so different. It's really nice to have that balance. We have another question from the chat. Um, it says that I read that the autism diagnosis for females is more difficult than it is for males because the standards were written based on the presentation in males. Do you find that the definitions are being updated in a way that helps identify symptoms of autism in both genders more equally? My gosh, I love this question. I know. Um, <laughs> a good question. A um, question. Molly, do you want to take it first, or sure? I? Um, I well, the the definitions and the criteria has not been updated to reflect different presentations in uh, in girls. 
Um, but we absolutely talk about this topic a lot and try to read a lot about um, what research is finding. Um, we do know, like the, the test that I give, the ADOS is normed on males. So um, that always has to sort of be in our minds as we're looking at those results. What we know about girls is that their social skills, their foundational social skills tend to be more intact than with boys on the spectrum. And that leads to the question, why is that? Is there some sort of protective genetic factor that girls have with this? Or is it our culture expecting girls to have more of that skill than boys? Um, so these are all questions that, that we wrestle with. And um, you know, I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of teenage girls come into the clinic um, asking their own questions about this and self-referring and saying, I feel like something is different. I feel like I may have autism. Um, and they've gone their whole lives up until 16, 17 years old. And no one has really picked up on it because it's subtle. Um, and it's, it's, you know, a repetitive behavior may not look like, you know, a, a girl flapping in somewhere or rocking. Um, it may look like she likes to read the same book over and over and over and over. Right. So it's, it's a much, can be a much subtler presentation. Um, but yes, it's, it's something that the tools we have need to catch up with what we're learning and they haven't quite done that yet. Yeah, our, you know, things are very slow to change in terms <laughs> of like day-to-day -day clinical work and the tools that we use. And a lot of the tools that Molly and I have access to and have been trained to use have been around for a while. Certainly there are newer tools. Um, but this really makes us think because we really um, respect sort of the, the privilege of doing what we do and the power of a diagnosis. And so, you know, when we see somebody over the course of two mornings, so we, we could potentially spend like six hours with a particular patient and their family. Um, that's a lot of data to just kind of sit with and to think about, and we do specific tests and we use that data. And ultimately autism is a clinical diagnosis. There's no one specific test that says yes or no, um, that you have an autism spectrum disorder. And um, it can be really hard to tease out the data in a way that makes the most sense, especially when you have somebody who heartily disagrees with what you say, um, whether or not you support or don't support an autism diagnosis. And that's really hard because at the same time, for younger children, an autism diagnosis can open the door for many, many services. But autism looks a lot like many other things. It, um, kids who experience significant trauma and adversity can present like they have autism-like symptoms. Very, very anxious kids can present with significant social difficulties that may look like autism. Um, and we're seeing more families who we think the parents are also on the autism spectrum when they bring their child in. And so that's also an interesting conversation to start to have to think about, A, how do we talk about this? Should we talk about it? And what, what is a diagnosis gonna do? So, um, for young kids, again, like it opens the door for services. We know that the, the more intensive earlier intervention that kids can get from an early age, like starting at one, um, the better the outcomes are potentially. But what are the services, what are the interventions for a 16 year old, like Molly was describing, whose presentation may be a little bit more subtle um, and may not be all that impairing to like the teachers that she works with. Mm -hmm. But the patient herself is really, really, really kind of discouraged um, and impacted by the subtlety of symptoms. Um, and so it is a really interesting place to be. And also think about who determines the treatment plan. Is it us as providers? Is it the teenager who knows themselves especially well? Is it the parents um, at the same time? So it's it's a really unique position, I think, to be in, um, in this type of clinical work doing what we're doing. But um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of thinking about the female to male ratio of autism. It's still four to one. For every four boys, there's only one girl that's getting a diagnosis of autism. 
Um, and also thinking about the diagnosis of autism in non-white people. Mm -hmm. um, so people from marginalized um, backgrounds, people who from BIPOC populations, um, you know, those are the kids that we're not seeing because they're not presenting to our clinic. They're not presenting to clinics around the country. There's still a lot of stigma and a lot of shame related to neurodevelopmental disorders, mental health issues. And we as a field have to do a fair amount of reckoning with that too. Wow, thank you so much. That was a really great question that was asked and really great responses. Um, another question that uh, Dr. Dickerson, you might be able to speak on is just like, do you know the differences between the path towards becoming a psychiatrist or becoming a psychologist hmm. and those major differences that are between <clears throat> the two? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I guess I can speak broadly about it. So as psychiatrists, we're medical doctors. And so we prescribe medicine. Um, we go through medical school. We do everything um, we need to do in order to have a medical degree. But our focus is on emotional and behavioral health. Um, and what's great about psychiatry is there's a lot of different aspects that we could take um, clinically. So child psychiatry, adult psychiatry, geriatric psychiatry. You can be a forensic psychiatrist where you specifically work with people who um, are part of the criminal justice system. Um, substance abuse is a, is a huge area of psychiatry where more and more people are interested, thankfully, because it's a huge need. So focusing on the treatment of substance use disorders as well. Um, so we not only are able to prescribe medicine, but we also do therapy. And that's a big chunk of my job. Um, I do a lot of talking with people, um, which is really, really wonderful. And um, so there, there is a, like, I, I tend to think of psychiatry as like part, part medical doctor, part psychologist and part social worker. Um, we sort of do all three. Um, and a psychologist um, cannot prescribe medicine at this point. Um, and so they primarily are people who are trained to do um, a wide variety of things, but they also do therapy. And so you can be a psychologist and get licensed after you, I believe, get your master's or your doctorate in clinical psychology. Um, you can be licensed to do say, um, psychotherapy. Um, and we have a number of psychologists within our division of child psychiatry who we work alongside um, and they do the majority of psychotherapy for the, the number of patients that we see. Um, because it's real, we're as psychiatrists, we're really expensive. And so insurance companies would rather pay um, a lower amount of money for a psychologist to do therapy for 50 minutes than a psychiatrist, an MD, to do therapy for 50 minutes. And so, um, but for a lot of areas of the country, um, you know, there's such a there's such a dearth of mental health providers that um, there are psychiatrists who are doing a lot of psychotherapy um, in, in different parts of the country. So I think there are a lot of similarities, but there are, there are differences in terms of, of training aspects to our jobs. Thank you. Um, we have another question in the chat. So for Dr. Dickerson and Molly, what are your thoughts regarding the legalization of marijuana and concerns surrounding um, the developing brain, especially for teenage brains? <clears throat> oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful about this. I, I think, so here's, here's what I'll, I'll say. Um, there are probably a lot of people out there, adolescents, adults, who are able to use marijuana and um, they benefit from that. It does something positive for them. Um, there are also a number of people, teenagers and adults who smoke marijuana or use, it, use cannabis other ways um, and use a lot of it. And it really, really does affect their brain. And it is a potent risk factor for the development of a range of mental health issues. Those are the patients that I see. So my, my world is a bit biased because when I go to the emergency room and see a 19 year old um, who's presenting with hallucinations for the first time and gathering a history from their parents, they're reporting that 
he's been smoking increased in amounts of pot for the last five years. That that's where my brain is thinking about marijuana. Um, and I do think it has significant repercussions on the developing brain. And that's where the, you know, I think there's a lot of us in the medical field that support the legalization of marijuana, but we do not support the, the legalization of marijuana for people who have developing brains um, because I, I think it, it can be dangerous. And I think it's, um, we have to be very careful in how we talk about it because I think it is still risky when the media may portray it to be less risky than it actually is. Again, there are a lot of people out there who I, I think, again, smoke a little marijuana, use it from time to time and are doing all right. And uh, we know that it can help depression symptoms in moderation. We know that it can address anxiety to some extent. Um, but again, those are the people that I tend not to see in the emergency room late at night and who are coming in my office with, with um, significant mental health concerns. Well said, I, I agree. I echo everything that Jeremiah just said. And then just thinking about myself, you know, I have a 17 year old son. Um, and so we've, we've already had to have these kind of conversations. And that's the tack that I take with him is that, you know, your brain is developing and this is, this is something that could impact that development of your brain. And it's, it's one, you know, that that's something you don't want to mess around with. Right. Um, so that's sort of how I have these conversations with him about it. Um, but have also had experience with the mental health issues being um, profoundly uh, impacted by marijuana use as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky question. Thank you. And then another question um, just on, or so you both talked about stigma, like the stigmatization of mental health and just questions on how you really deal with that in both of your fields, um, since it's very prevalent. Yeah, I can, I can just say like, it's so, I think one of the positive aspects of this past year, if we can kind of look at some silver linings, is that um, there's been a lot more attention paid to mental health and mental wellness, right? As we're all sort of struggling with the pandemic and the lockdown and not being able to um, kind of seek out our social relationships um, and travel. Um, there's just a lot to be bummed out about the economic like downturn associated with COVID, people losing their jobs, people not being able to go to work kids not being able to go to school. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so it, it, it has helped to sort of normalize, like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling really crappy. Um, so is my friend, so is this person. And um, there's been a lot more conversation, I think about mental health issues and what we need to do in order to address mental health issues, but also promote mental wellness at the same time. And so, there's sort of been a normalization of things over the past year, which is which has been really wonderful to be a part of. At the same time though, um, we are seeing an increase in people who are presenting in need. Um, so we don't have enough inpatient psychiatric beds in the state of Vermont. Um, at any given time, there's a dozen or more people in the emergency room here at UVM awaiting a bed to be um, uh, housed on a psychiatric inpatient unit because they're experiencing thoughts of wanting to hurt themselves or their anxiety is too impairing or they are presenting with psychotic symptoms. Um, and there's still a lot of stigma attached to that because I think there's a lot of unknown. I think you know a lot of people still have the mentality of like, what's going on? Like you can just buck up and get over it. Mm -hmm but we're learning more and more about the biology of mental illness. And, um, you know, you wouldn't not see a doctor if you broke your arm, right? But there are so many people who will not see a doctor if they're experiencing depression or anxiety. And we have to do a much better job at figuring out how we can um, continue to sort of dispel the myths and think about the stigma that's attached to mental health issues. There, recently on Apple TV, I don't know if any of you saw the, the documentary series, um, The Me You Cannot See. I think that was the name of it, Molly, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, produced by Oprah Winfrey and um, Prince Harry. And um, it was a really wonderful 
kind of, I think it's like four or five episodes, like really taking a deep dive into the world of mental illness and um, kind of really taking a look at the stigma and the fact and fiction of people who are struggling and having celebrities like Lady Gaga talk about her past trauma and um, seeking help. And I think the more, again, that we're able to talk about it and sort of normalize it, hopefully over time, the less stigmatizing it, it will be. Wow, yeah, that's really great. And Molly, I don't know if you want to contribute anything as well. I mean, Jeremiah is so eloquent in how he answers these questions. It's hard to follow him. Um, but I would just say I have noticed over the past year um, with the graduate students and the struggles, um, the mental health struggles that a lot of our students are experiencing, um, some for the first time, has been um, just really significant um, and trying to you know, check in and make sure that they're getting the support that they need um, has been a big part of what we as faculty have been trying to figure out how to do and how to do well. Um, because just losing that, that normalcy and just being in a room with other people where you can have that real human connection um, is, is, is significant and impacts all of us. Great, thank you so much. So I think we have time for one last question before we move on to the next segment. Mm -hmm. um, so for the last one, as you both have mentioned, you obviously deal with a lot of heavy hitting patients and cases and things like that. So what are your best ways to decompress after a stressful work day or work week if you just have anything that you think really works and might be good advice for anyone who's interested in going into psychiatry or anything or SLP work for anything like that? Uh, for me, I think it's one thing I've learned is that I literally have to get the stress out of my body. <laughs> uh, and there's been research about this too, is like literally just moving my body, whether it's walking my dog, you know, going to the park and just moving. Um, is, is really, really important for me. Otherwise that stress does just stay in your body and, and you can feel the weight of it. Um, I think also being able to find humor um, and find moments of the day where you, you make some levity um, is really important too. And that's why I love our team is because we're able to help each other do that. Um, and, you know, for myself, I have my own mental health support. You know, I have a therapist. Um, who is, has just been wonderful for me to try to work through some of the work-life balance things that occur. Um, and so I think taking care of your own mental health is, is really, really important. Um, and, you know, good friends mm -hmm. and family to talk to and just, just support you when you have those, those hard days um, is really important. Yeah, I would, I would echo everything that Molly said. Um, it's really important to take care of yourself, especially if you're needing to take care of people who um, are experiencing a lot of hardship. I think one of the things that we do um, in our clinic is we really try to focus on strengths and really trying to focus on sort of what's, what's going well for these families and for these kids that we're seeing and take sort of a strengths-based approach to talking to families. At the same time, being realistic about sort of how impaired their child may be um, in terms of their communication skills, their language skills, their intellectual profile. Um, and, you know, I, for me, um, humor is a, is, a, is a sort of a big part of what I do. And, and um, it is helpful to work with somebody who's like shares your sense of humor. So you're able to kind of have fun and laugh. Um, and, um, I like to get massages. So I, I never had a massage until like five years ago. Um, and I don't know how I lasted so long because um, <laughs> it's pretty phenomenal. Um, and just sort of like allows yourself to relax. And the other thing I think is, is like in, in the world of medicine, I think we're often taught and maybe not so much anymore that we can't be human. Um, so, we like there are tears that are shed in our office not just by families and patients but by us as well and i i just think there's power in being vulnerable um 
and being okay with being a human being who's talking about hard things and having to do uncomfortable things and share difficult news with families. And man, if I was holding that in all the time, um, I'd really suffer because of that. So I think just being open and honest about your own emotions is helpful. And then finding outlets, um, getting therapy, getting massages, singing karaoke, um, going for walks. Um, I think we're really lucky to live here in Vermont where I live close to the lake. So I can like get in a kayak and go kayaking um, if I wanted to after work. And so um, I'm just really, really grateful for the opportunity to do the things that I love to do. Um, that makes my work life a little less overwhelming at times. Thank you so much. I feel like both of that is just such powerful advice. And now we're gonna let you talk a little bit about what you do together. Um, and so you can take it away with this video we're going to watch and explain what we wanna be looking for. Yeah, so this is, um, this is exciting. So we're gonna show a clip from Sesame Street. And um, a couple of years ago, Sesame Street introduced a new Muppet named Julia. And um, not to give it away, um, because it's, it might be obvious from what Molly and I do, but um, Julia is a little girl with autism. And um, this is really wonderful for families to see. Um, you know, Sesame Street has, is just so progressive. Like recently they, I think they had um, a homeless Muppet. Um, they recently introduced um, a same-sex couple um, on Sesame Street for the first time. And so the opportunity for something like this to reach kids and families who may not have um, exposure to kids who are different or people who are living a different lifestyle than their own family is, is a really, really powerful way to um, educate and to open people's eyes to what's out there. So what Molly and I want to do is, is show this clip. Maybe we'll show like, you know, five minutes of this, this clip from Sesame Street that introduces Julia. And then our hope is that um, you guys can sort of share what you observe about Julia, um, things that make her a little bit different than the other kids and the other Muppets. Um, and then Molly and I can talk about like how we would assess her, what questions we would ask her parents. Um, and hopefully this will foster some discussion for the last um, several minutes or so. Thank you, we'll start that right now. I don't think we can hear it, Julian. Sorry about that. I was on mute, which wouldn't make sense. Here we go. There. Um, just one second. Thanks, Julian. Okay. So I'm wondering if, if folks just want to kind of comment on things that were a little bit different um, about Julia that, that set her apart from, from her friends and what, you know, Big Bird and others were observing in Julia. Something I noticed right away is how she didn't say hello back. And I kind of noticed when Big Bird at first was offended or almost thought she might not like him or her. Um, and just like that kind of dynamic. Absolutely. Yeah, sort of the responsiveness of Julia was a little different. Yeah, then I think, she, you know, she's probably what, about four, four years old. Um, so you'd expect some, some interaction um, from her that she didn't um, display upon introduction. Um, I also, noticed that uh, Julia would rep repeat words or sounds um, multiple times, um, that she was doing that a lot just throughout that video. Absolutely, and there is the clinical term for that is echolalia, when someone repeats words that they've heard other people say. So she was doing quite a bit of that. We also noticed that the sounds would really overstimulate her. Um, so when the mm -hmm. siren came on, that was almost a trigger. Yeah, so there's a lot of kids who um, have autism and a lot of kids who frankly don't have autism who have a lot of sensory sensitivities, whether it's to loud noises, um, bright lights, um, textures, 
um, it tastes of food, um, maybe aversive. And then we also see kids who um, have sensory interests. So kids who are really into sort of the feel of something or the taste of something um, or certain lights or certain noises that really attract them at the same time. And we noticed too that she had an attachment um, to her stuffed animal and that was something that really calmed her down. Yes, we often yeah. find um, with kids that they can um, become very fixated on objects. And so there may be an object. Um, so we met a boy this week who comes in with his three cars um, every day, the same three cars and has to carry them with him wherever he goes. So um, there, there can be that attachment to objects, which you might see in really young kids, but at this point in time, um, you don't typically see that in a child of four. Yeah, one of, one of the aspects of, of doing what we do is we really have to try to figure out what's, what, what would be developmentally appropriate for a kid this age and wouldn't warrant a diagnosis or wouldn't be necessarily out of the ordinary or all that atypical versus you know, thinking about um, what would be considered developmentally atypical um, for a child this age. And sometimes that's really tricky to tease apart because like I said, a lot of kids have sensory sensitivities. Mm -hmm. Like Molly alluded to, there are a lot of kids who have objects that they carry around a lot. It's perfectly normal. Um, and there are a lot of kids who repeat words um, at the same time, repeat things they've heard from television shows or funny things that their parents have said. And so it takes a little investigating to really sort of tease out um, some of those behaviors. And this kind of goes into a question I had, but so how would you approach the conversation with a child like Julia's family in a diagnosis setting or in the autism clinic like you talked about? Yeah, so we would, um, we would do a couple things. One is we would sit down with the family, um, a mom or dad, just mom, just dad. Um, we often see grandparents. Mm -hmm. We often have like teachers join us also for our evaluations, which is really, really wonderful. Um, and we would try to get a really thorough history about when people started to have concerns about Julia because um, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. So what that means is that um, symptoms are likely to be seen within the first sort of year to two years of life. Um, and then those, those symptoms, those behaviors may um, kind of evolve over time and sort of wax and wane in intensity. But part of our job is to sort of um, figure that out, to, to kind of put a timeline together in terms of what people are seeing. Um, we do know that a lot of kids with autism may not play games like peekaboo when they're one and a half years old. And, and that's a pretty um, typical game that a lot of kids engage in pretty naturally. We ask about eye contact from an early age. Like when you called Julia's name around the age of one, did she look at you? Um, when you walked into a room, did she turn to notice you? Um, so part of my job is to really dig deep in terms of that developmental history and get a good sense of sort of the, the trajectory of Julia um, and also figure out what she's good at, like where her strengths are, um, what her parents really love about her, um, what do they celebrate about her, because part of our job, again, is to really foster that um, as well. So I, I talk to parents and I get a history um, and we also get to play um, yeah. with these kids as well, which is a really fantastic part of my job. I'm on the ground like half of the day playing with Legos, um, which is pretty fantastic. Um, and then Molly would, would um, um, engage Julia in some specific testing with her mom or dad. Mm -hmm. Right, where we would look at um, really early social communication skills like responding to her name or does she give objects to other people? Does she show objects to other people? Does she point out things just for the sake of showing it to you when she doesn't want anything. Um, so some of these early social communication skills, we, I set up scenarios to try to really see um, if the child is able to engage in those. And then always as a speech language pathologist, I'm always listening to the language that they have um, and the quality and type of that language. So um, for a child who has echolalia, you know, we meet some kids who's language is seemingly on target. They may um, do pretty well on language testing in a formal setting, 
But when you really talk to them and engage with them, you notice that their language is a bit scripted um, where they've lifted things that they've heard from either movies or other people. And they tend to use the same phrases over and over. And they have a hard time with social reciprocity. So that like back and forth of conversation, that engagement, that my turn, your turn, and we're sharing this together and it's an equal uh, situation. So um, there's lots of social communication and speech language things that we're looking for. And then the other piece of the autism diagnosis is the restricted and repetitive behaviors, which for Julia um, would be the motor behaviors that she presents with. So the flapping, the bouncing, um, those specific things that we're looking for and need to ask parents about what they see at home. Thank you so much. And then, let's see. Um, just anyone has a final question, they're welcome to put it in the chat. We just have really time, uh, one or two minutes, and then we'll, we'll be having Shubi speak on the Med Mentor program really quickly. Um, but I just want to ask you guys, or thank you so much for being here. And just ask you to share what you really love about your job because you do seem like you have these incredible jobs where you get to work with really, really fantastic children and their families. And so if you could just say your favorite part of that, if there is even one. <laughs> that's Wait. hard, that, that's hard. Um, I would say the big, the thing that brings me the most joy is getting to meet the families and the kids, hearing their stories and being able to work with a colleague who shares my passion and my commitment to, um, to the human, bringing the humanity to this whole process for families. Um, that's really a joy and it's not something you find every day. So I'm very grateful for that and for Jeremiah. Wow. <laughs> oh man, um, I'm grateful as well for Molly. I, I think we have we have an amazing team. We are working within a setting that allows us to do our job and do it well. That the luxury of time, like Molly alluded to, yeah. is just such. Uh, we're, we're just so grateful to have the time to spend with families, and they're grateful for that as well. Um, and we get to meet people coming from all over the state of Vermont. Um, families that I would never meet otherwise. We get to hear such interesting stories. Um, and again, being part of a family's journey and to see their kid um, get services and demonstrate improvements um, is really, really wonderful. So um, we're, we're both, I think, really grateful to be able to do what we do. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing this with us. We really greatly appreciate it. And this will be uploaded onto YouTube to share as well. And then we do just have a quick presentation. Let's see, one moment. Let me share. So. Yes, and so we're joined by a um, medical student at the Larner College of Medicine at University of Vermont, who just completed his first year. Um, his name is Shuby, and he is going to be speaking on this program tonight. And so you can take it away, Shubi. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Julian and Lily, for having me here. Uh, again, thank you so much, uh, Molly and uh, Dr. Dickerson. Uh, actually, it's funny because we just uh, had the psychiatry course uh, in our first year, um, just our last block. Um, and so Dr. Dickerson provided many of the lectures. Um, so it was nice to see you again here. Um, and yeah, so basically, uh, once again, uh, officially at Shabankar Joshi, but everyone calls me Shubi. And um, my colleague, a classmate, Natalie Bales, is actually in um, halfway across the world right now doing research. So uh, tonight you'll only have me to talk about our program here. And it's called a medical education directive. So basically uh, what we're trying to do um, here, actually, uh, maybe we can advance the slide and then we'll get into it. <laughs> um, so yeah, again, uh, who are we based on rising second year medical students? Uh, specifically, we're the 2021-2022 Albert Schweitzer Fellows. And from our uh, school, uh, the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine, I believe there's about a group of uh, 12 of us, I wanna say. Um, and basically we were selected to complete certain projects um, within our communities. Um, and uh, ours specifically is the med program. and. 
Um, we're just going to get into that uh, just a little bit to see what, what it's all about. So basically, uh, the program itself is a mentorship that pairs our underrepresented high school students uh, with pre-medical and medical students. And basically, we uh, provide mentors uh, who are the medical students or pre-medical students, and they will guide our mentees that are in, currently in high school uh, on the pathways to various healthcare fields and, you know, expose them to various tracks um, through um, different activities, workshops, trips, and these are offered by our partner organization. It's called Health Education Resource Opportunity or HERO program. And uh, I made this cool little diagram this morning. It's uh, so you can see it's kind of like a triangle effect where we have our medical students uh, supporting both pre-medical and high school students. And we're all engaging in the HERO program together. And that bigger triangle is called the uh, MED program overall. And officially it's a program within the Northern Vermont uh, area Health Education Center, uh, also known as AHEC. And um, just to get into more about what HERO is, so HERO, um, as you can see from the various pictures, I didn't want to bog you down with various words, but, um, you know, HERO program overall, the goal is to support students uh, specifically in the Winooski and Burlington high schools to enter a healthcare uh, career. But the thing is, we wanted to also expand this opportunity um, through uh, Vermont Reach as well as uh, Jillian and Lily were providing uh, an audience for us. Uh, we want to connect all these students across Vermont, you know, being able to uh, expand these opportunities and make sure that everyone that's interested in the program and seeking mentorship uh, should be able to access it. And basically, a little background about HERO program, it's provided to students at no cost at all. And there's typically five components. So one will be medical skills training certifications, then you have your mentoring aspect. Um, there's the career exploration, as well as hands-on health science activities. These can include, uh, you know, your suture clinics, as well as blood pressure cuff readings and um, uh, EMT training in terms of, you know, doing CPR training as well as that. And also, finally, there's also the college, uh, college and career uh, planning guidance. So with that, uh, that's our partner organization, Hero, and what we want to do through the Med program which is our overall organization that was created last year by two medical students, um, Neva and Akua. And what we're doing is uh, me and Natalie are taking over for them for the second year. And we're trying to expand this program to be able to include uh, another layer of mentors uh, with our pre-medical students. And uh, Jillian and Lily have um, provided those uh, for us um, in the upcoming months. We're going to be discussing, uh, you know, trying to connect all of us together. And but I just wanted to give a quick shout out. I know I uh, crunched on time, so I don't want to um, take up too much of the evening. But uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out to me. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, and I think uh, that should be it for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a great program that they have. And we're very excited and happy to be connecting with them and collaborating. So um, definitely you'll yeah. be hearing about it from us if you are on our, if you've been registered for um, BT Reach and are getting our newsletters. And thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next month for our July session, which will be on the 15th, which is the third Thursday of the month instead of the fourth um, to we're gonna be um, joined by a, uh, the Governor's Institute, which is um, related to AHEC, as Shubi was mentioning. So yes, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight and for participating. Thank you, Molly and Dr. Dickerson and Shubi, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Jeremiah, that was amazing. Thanks for having us. Oh my gosh, it was just like beautifully choreographed. <laughs> it was like as if you had, you know, practiced it um, over and over again. It was like- There was no practice. Um, I, I think it speaks to like Molly and I 